What if I told you it's 1985? You're 25 years old, and you just graduated from the prestigious New England Conservatory of Music. Your music of choice is called Klezmer. That's what's playing now in the background. It's a type of Jewish folk music. You're booking gigs in Boston with your new band, playing this unique brand of music. When one day, someone asks if you'd be willing to take the show on the road. But there's a catch. Because there's always a catch. The show wouldn't just be about the music. And the road wouldn't just be going up and down the East Coast on I-95. It would be just a bit further than that. He wants you to go behind the Iron Curtain into the Soviet Union. Figure out a way to locate a group of musicians called the Phantom Orchestra. Get their very valuable personal information and then smuggle it back into the United States. And there's one more thing. There's always one more thing. In all likelihood, you're going to be searched by the KGB and followed by the KGB, interrogated by the KGB, detained by the KGB, and arrested by the KGB. Now, would that be something you'd be interested in doing? Probably not. But we spoke with someone who was. For me, this was a super duper adventure. Like, why wouldn't I do it? My gosh. This is DIA Connections. This seemed like such a a really incredible adventure and, you know, very spy-like and undercover. And when we went in, didn't understand all of the risks and all of the dangers. They realized that playing music might be a way to really get the word out and be something different and gain some recognition in the West. They took us into a back room with three very big men, started screaming at us in Russian. That was a moment of real, you know, like, oh my God, we are in it. Glad you could join us for this episode of DIA Connections. We're calling this one Sax and the Spy. The Defense Intelligence Agency encourages applicants from any educational track to apply for positions with us. Whether or not you have military experience or a degree in math or engineering or political science or even music. Yes, indeed, music majors are welcome to. Playing a musical instrument is kind of like solving a puzzle. I think that being a musician can help uh, bring a unique approach to solving problems at what I do at DIA. That's Blake Helander. He's a program manager in DIA's analytic innovation office. He has a master's in music performance, and he was a tuba player with the Army Band. Repeating processes over and over again until difficult things become easy, and then breaking difficult concepts down into smaller, more manageable pieces. And then over time, you'll speed it up and put the pieces together until you you master it, just like you master a musical instrument. Okay, hang on. I know by now you're saying, what's up with the tuba guy? The show's supposed to be about a saxophonist. True, but it's also about how a knowledge of the arts can help you think in ways that others don't. I think that an artistic mind and a creative mind is a good way to to solve problems in a different way. Our special guest, saxophonist Meryl Goldberg, agrees. 
I absolutely think that the arts train your brain to do really well at different areas of work. Blake and Merrill are linked because they creatively find solutions to complex problems by using skills learned as trained musicians. Blake does it each day at DIA by managing software tools for Intel analysts. And Merrill did it during the Cold War, when she took a trip to the USSR and hoodwinked the KGB. I remember thinking, we need something that is really going to be able to be hidden in plain sight. And it worked. Dr. Merrill Goldberg is a professor of music in the School of Arts at California State University, San Marcos. She's a professional saxophonist and recording artist who's toured internationally and recorded over a dozen CDs with major labels. This story has a little bit of everything. Guile, swagger, fear, and just the right amount of chutzpah. Here's Defense Intelligence Agency Chief Historian Paul Isaacson to help us get to the bottom of this skillfully conducted clandestine caper. Meryl Goldberg, thank you. Welcome to DIA Connections. Thank you so much for being with us today. And let's jump in to this wonderful story. All right. First, I'm going to begin. Tell us about what you were doing in the 1980s. What, where were you? What were you doing? And what kind of music were you playing? I had just graduated from New England Conservatory of Music in Boston and had started a performing career playing uh, klezmer music, which is Eastern European Yiddish music. And I played with a group called the Klezmer Conservatory Band. It was music that was played by the Jews all over Eastern Europe. And what's interesting about it is, let's say there were Jews in Germany or Russia or Latvia. The music would mesh with the local folks. And so you've got these really interesting Jewish kind of sounding Eastern Europe music mixing together. The other members of the band are important to the story, too. There's Jeff. He plays mandolin and guitar. Hankus plays keyboards. And Rosalie sings. And of course, there's Merrill. My instrument is saxophone. So I played uh, sax... Uh, I still do. I play saxophone. I majored in, of all things, classical saxophone at the conservatory. Believe it or not, there's lots of music for classical saxophone. When I explain klezmer, sometimes I tell people, think fiddler on the roof, but a little bit more authentic. Let's stay back in those 1980s. And I want to ask you kind of about what was going on in the Soviet Union in that same time, in the 1980s, in terms of the difficulty that particularly Jews were having in getting out of the USSR if they wanted, right? Exactly. So the 80s were a very, very challenging, difficult time. At that time, the Soviet Union was really coming down on a lot of freedoms, not just Jewish people, but in general, uh, kind of crushing down on dissidents and human rights activists. It was a, a rough go of it. There were a lot of Jewish people who were called refuseniks, which meant that they wanted to leave the Soviet Union, but they were refused to get exit visas. CBS News presents Today, Soviet Jews, a culture in peril. This is a report on the Soviet Union's attitude toward its Jewish citizens, those they permit to leave and those for whom emigration is blocked. Exit visas meant freedom but it was next to impossible to get one. Refuseniks endured harsh consequences by merely requesting one. They were considered enemies of the state, and some went to prison. A group of refuseniks had gotten together in Tbilisi, Georgia, which is south of Moscow, and they decided to literally band together because many of them played music and form what they called the Phantom Orchestra. Tell us a little bit more about this phantom orchestra, and I love that name too. Tell us how they got started and what what were they trying to do? Playing music was a way to feel freedom 
even when you're not in a place where you are physically free. This group, the Phantom Orchestra, were using music as a way to let the West know about their plight, but also to use music themselves as a way to feel, in, you know, uh, camaraderie and to gain some momentum and hope. For refuseniks at that time, if people knew about you, you had a much better chance of getting an exit visa. Dissidents and refuseniks across the USSR wanted the world to take notice of their plight. Change could happen if people knew about them. So, when advocacy groups in the West heard stories about refuseniks called the Phantom Orchestra, it was music to their ears. And at some point, some people approached you with this idea to go and support this effort in the Soviet Union. Why you? Why you? Why did they come to you? <laughs> yeah, Let's start exactly there. right. Why, why you? <laughs> <laughs> why me? <laughs> the people at Action for Soviet Jewry actually had already known the band leader, Hankus Netsky, and approached Hankus first, you know, said, hey, we've got this idea. We've got these people in Tbilisi. Usually we send in doctors, lawyers, engineers, whatever. We were thinking it might be a really incredible thing to send in musicians. So, Meryl, what was your reaction to being asked to do this thing? Cool. I am totally in. This seemed like such a, a really incredible adventure and, you know, very spy-like and undercover. It was 1985. And as a result of a string of high-profile espionage arrests by the FBI and its partners, the press dubbed it the Year of the Spy. We certainly didn't understand the extent to which things were really bad in terms of our people who were actual real spies in the Soviet Union getting either killed or knocked off or whatever. It was a terrible, terrible year. But of course, we know none of this. They were not just another band out of Boston. They were four klezmer musicians trying to survive a tour in the Soviet bloc under the ruse of a cultural exchange program. But they had a big problem. If Soviet authorities found names or addresses or family relationships and birth dates written down on paper, it would jeopardize the mission and cause harm to themselves and the people they were trying to help. The situation called for improvisation. So what did you do instead to keep them safe? I remember thinking, we need something that is really going to be able to be hidden in plain sight. So we knew we had to code everything. We're musicians and, you know, they're going to question why we're bringing our instruments anyways. So if it's in music, they won't ever figure it out. So I developed a code that is in music. The note A is the letter A. And then I've got all sorts of other notes that are the alphabet. And then I obscured it by making it look like piano music. So there's a, um, a G clef and an F clef. And uh, I've got all sorts of rhythms in there. Actually, if you compared it to like a, a Schoenberg piano piece. My piece looks like Sesame Street Schoenberg, um, my music notes. But to anyone looking at it, there's no way on earth you would look at that and think this was coded information. Her sheet music became an encrypted language. Legitimate musical notations meshed with tiny hidden diagrams of names and meeting places. Details that would have been too difficult to memorize. It was a brilliantly coded murky mix of information decipherable only by the conservatory band. But one thing was crystal clear. It was useless if it couldn't pass the eye test at the Moscow airport. You have given your enthusiastic 100% yes to this trip. You've got this plan. You know, at some point, did you think, gosh, this is really spy stuff here. Did you get any training before you left? Yeah, so we had some training. If we're asked some questions, never lie, but never give up 
any information. Be firm, be confident. But what happened to us was something that, no, we weren't trained for. <laughs> and I think quite unexpected. They took us into a back room with three very big men, started screaming at us in Russian. They were asked what the purpose of their trip was, and if they knew anyone in the Soviet Union, and what relatives they'd be visiting. Bad cop, good cop, good cop, bad cop. One guy was screaming and yelling at us and banging on the table. The interrogation lasted three hours. Father's occupation, mother's name. Are you members of a political group trying to undermine the Soviet government? That was a moment of real, you know, like, oh my God, we are in it. I tell you, they went through every single thing. They, you know, makeup they opened up. They, they, it was crazy how thoroughly they searched our stuff. They went through every single page of my manuscript book, looking page by page by page, and then they handed it right back to me, which was incredible. Their music wasn't confiscated, and they didn't buckle under KGB interrogation. The smart play now was to not arouse any suspicion when they hit the streets of Moscow. So Merrill, Jeff, Hankus, and Rosalie did the usual touristy things until they noticed something. We realized that there were people following us. They were under surveillance, but still, they were on a mission. So off they went to Tbilisi, Georgia, to find the Phantom Orchestra. And we realized again, we have people following us. And this time it looks like there's more people following us than even in Moscow. Then came the real cloak and dagger stuff, the type of thing you see in the movies. So in our 26-year-old brains, we think, we're going to out with the KGB. We're going to come up with a plan where we all get on the subway, and then, you know, at the last minute, we're all going to get off the subway, but Rosalie and I are going to jump back on, and our minders are going to follow Hankus and Jeff, because they're going to follow the guys. and we're gonna go on and we're gonna go find the Phantom Orchestra. Now, to find the Phantom Orchestra, we couldn't call them because their phones had been disconnected. So we had no choice but to follow encoded directions to get to their apartment from our music. We find the apartment of Grigory Goldstein and we, you know, knock on the door and he's so excited to see us. The first thing we say is we're pretty sure that they didn't follow us here. And he laughed at us and he, you know, pointed out, are you kidding? They're all right there. <laughs> and he says, just come on in. <laughs> the KGB does what they do. We do what we do. That night, Rosalie and I had our first introduction to the Phantom Orchestra, and what an evening it was. We meet these amazing, wonderful musicians. These people played classical and folk and crazy things like jingle bells. It was amazing. As I think about what you were doing there and how you were very much on a secret mission and you were having to be fake in certain ways, I just find it so good that you found this real love of music, that that wasn't fake. Music really bonds people, right? Some of the refuseniks, like the Goldsteins and the Godavas, spoke some English, but some of the refuseniks didn't. But our music, through our music, it was like I knew these folks forever. The other thing that is so important and, and something I, I learned that I will also take with me for the rest of my life is that when you're playing music, you can be free. 
And so the act of playing music with the Phantom Orchestra was this time of ultimate, utmost freedom. Meryl, I understand at one point everyone played and sang a song that you're very familiar with, and that meant a lot to you. Can you tell us about that? Are you talking about uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow? I sure am. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) You know, the second night that we played with the Phantom Orchestra, we played for them, they played for us, we all played together, and they started playing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which was just so poignant. Because when you think about Somewhere Over the Rainbow, it's really this hopeful desire and wish to be free, to have freedoms, to you know experience life in a way that is how people should experience life. And to hear that from people who were really stuck and were being persecuted, um, but could sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, it was so touching. To this day, that tune is something super special to me. You just heard the original recording of Over the Rainbow from that night. But what we didn't play for you was the introduction by a little boy. He was fully aware that the KGB was listening, and we want to play that for you. It's a bit hard to understand, but what he said was, And now, my latest song, Over the Rainbow. Hear it well, police. And now, my latest song... Uh, our rainbow. Heard it well, please. Let's begin. I'm also struck by not just the power of the music, but you were going over there to help them, but they were then caring for you. Exactly. And you know, I really understand now, you know, when we went in, like you said, we're, we're thinking we're helping people in need. Well, in fact, what we were doing was learning about the moral courage and the depth of which people can have that moral courage. And what we learned was we were there really as a way to be a voice in the West and, you know, to bring out their story and in some ways to be part of their protection and agency to be free. But they were not people, quote unquote, in need. They were such courageous, strong, powerful people. The next night when the band met with the Refuseniks, the KGB imposed their will and shut it down. They also did another round of interrogation. And this one came with a warning. Their freedom cannot be guaranteed. But the conservatory band weren't deterred. They were actually inspired. For eight days, they traveled across the Soviet Union playing music and meeting with dissidents. You were also gathering your information, weren't you? You were you were also accomplishing your mission. How did that part go? Were you able to do both over those evenings? Yes, we would feverishly write in all of this information. Now, we never let people know about the code, uh, even the people we met, because we, you know, obviously didn't want that ever to be found out. And we, we wanted to make sure we left with our manuscript books, our music manuscript books. So you guys were not only bringing out names and addresses, but you were bringing out personal stories, right? Oh, yes. Yes. We brought out a lot of personal stories. Can you remember anything about any particular story that you brought back? Yeah. In fact, I I still have all the stories, the stuff that we took down. Like with the Godava brothers, they were in medical school. They were physicians and they, they were playing rock music and the KGB didn't like it. And they were outspoken young guys in college and they started getting beaten and they would do things the KGB like they beat up their mom oh it was you know kind of horrible stories like that but the kinds of things that the west needed to know these were some of the more horrendous tactics of uh, the KGB at the time to try to get people either under control or not to speak out While you were on this trip, Meryl, did it sort of settle in on you, the weight of your mission and the fact that these people were counting on you to 
get their information out so they could actually get their freedom and escape this place? Yes. I would say when we first were were there, it felt more like a movie and, you know, we were in this really weird movie set. But as we got to know them and play music and then really understand their stories and that coupled with having the KGB interrupt one of our performances, we really understood the importance of getting the information out. And that really settled in in a profound manner. Yeah, I would say we did. Were you becoming less scared or was it just sort of maintaining a level of fear or getting more scared at the end? Or what, what was, you, how are you doing in terms of your, your awareness of danger throughout the trip? We gained so much courage from the Phantom Orchestra themselves. That second night when we were playing and the KGB interrupted us, Isai Goldstein defied the KGB and started toasting, toasting us, toasting, being able to leave. And, you know, this defiance in front of the KGB was like, wow, okay, we don't have to be silent. We don't need to sit back. We don't need to be scared. And those lessons sunk in in such a way that on that last forced car ride when you know i thought there was a real possibility that we were going again to siberia i mean that they would really lock us up that was when any level of terror i had turned into defiance as well and to a sense of peaceful i can handle whatever is going to happen Word was spreading to other refuseniks about the Boston Quartet, and that infuriated the Soviet authorities. Their response was deportation, but not before placing them under arrest and taking them to a location that wasn't Siberia, but it was, as Merrill described, quote, a place where there was no possibility of anyone finding us. Then Reuters, one of the world's largest international news agencies, ran a story that read, four Americans expelled after Soviet meeting precisely the attention the Refuseniks were seeking, but not the band. Because remember, their mission wasn't complete. Names, addresses, birth dates, and stories coded in sheet music still had to be smuggled out. Remarkably, when we were leaving the country under heavy military... um, Escort. Escort. Yeah, that's the right word. That would be the nicest nicest way of putting it, right? Yes. Again, they went through every single page of my manuscript book, as well as, you know, Hankus and Jeff's and uh, Rosalie's, and uh, they did not confiscate it. We got it out. That was a big score. We got bonus points for that. The news outlets began to focus their attention on the plight of Refuseniks, but unfortunately, it came at a cost for Merrill's new friends. After we left, all of the Phantom Orchestra folks, their houses were searched. Some were arrested. Some were beaten. Reza, the Gudava's mother, was beaten. She was in her 80s. That was really, 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 really hard for me, hearing about all of that. You think, oh my God, look what we did. Look what resulted. Ultimately, everyone they met did get an exit visa, which was due in large part to the activism from around the world. We worked with the Catholic Church in Boston, the Archdiocese. We went down to Washington, D.C., Steny Hoyer and Tom Lantos and D'Amato. We worked with Ted Kennedy. We worked with all of them in a very intense way. And, you know, it made a big difference. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and the General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Three times in the mid-1980s, President Ronald Reagan met with Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev to discuss reducing the nuclear arsenals of the two superpowers. At each meeting, Reagan gave Gorbachev names of Soviet Jews who had been refused visas or had been sent to prison for activism. From around the world, pressure was mounting on the Soviet regime. Then, in December 1987, in Washington, D.C., there was a crucial turning point. There have been a quarter of a million with us today, the largest crowd in Jewish history. 
It was called Freedom Sunday for Soviet Jews and featured a message for Gorbachev. It was delivered loud and clear by Vice President George Bush. And now Mr. Gorbachev's embarked on this policy of glasnost or openness, but openness begins at the borders. Let's see not five or six or ten or twenty refuseniks released at a time, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, all those who want to go. Mr. Gorbachev, let these people go. Let them go. Let them go. It didn't happen overnight. But eventually, emigration restrictions eased and Soviet Jews were allowed to leave in larger numbers. And by the time Gorbachev left office in 1991, hundreds of thousands of refuseniks had been issued exit visas and Jewish political prisoners were freed. We began the show with DIA's own Blake Helander talking about how he's leaned on his prowess as a musician to help him contribute to the mission. Here's more from Blake. I made a midlife career change from music to the uh, the intelligence community. It wasn't planned. It was due to a to an injury that I sustained from over practicing, actually. And so, at first, I thought, "Oh, I'm way behind the curve. I know nothing about this. I can't even spell intelligence." But I ended up picking up the job fairly quickly through some of the tools and techniques I learned from music. We need a lot of diverse approaches and different ways of thinking in order to uh, bring something new to the fight. That type of diversity of thought is fundamental for a successful career at DIA, just like it was for Merrill on her week-long odyssey behind the Iron Curtain. There's a Hebrew word that epitomizes Merrill's actions many years ago. It's mitzvah. It means a deed performed on the highest level of human kindness. Well done, Meryl, and we're honored to let you put a coda on this episode of DIA Connections with accompaniment from the Phantom Orchestra. The arts really are very powerful. And knowing your why, like in any profession, you know, especially I think in the intelligence profession, is really important. When we went in, we thought our why was really to, you know, help people and support people that were in need. But we found out our why was really about being a voice for human courage, for people who really were remarkable. And Meryl Goldberg, you are also remarkable. Thanks for all that you did for the Refuseniks, and thank you for being on DIA Connections. To learn more about the Defense Intelligence Agency, check us out on DIA.mil. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to DIA Connections. As always, thanks for listening.